Då är klockan prick 13.30 och jag hälsar er välkomna tillbaka från lunchen. Hoppas det smakade. Ett par praktiska saker innan vi drar igång programmet. Som ni kanske minns så berättade jag att en programpunkt utgår idag. Och det är Kerstin Aronssons presentation klockan 15.20. Det innebär att vi har lite mer tid för frågor vid varje presentation nu. Och sen att vi får skjuta kaffe och fika något eventuellt. Eller så blir det mer tid för kaffe och fika och mingel. Vi börjar som vanligt igen sen efter fikat 15.40. Ingen Kerstin Aronsson alltså. Sen vill jag också påminna igen om middagen ikväll att ni tar med er era namnbrickor och har ni en röd prick på den så visar ni den för då visar ni att ni har anmält er. Är det så att ni har anmält er till middagen och inte kommer så skulle vi uppskatta väldigt mycket om ni sa till vid registreringen så att vi kan göra en not om det. Sen var det också så att som ni kan få komma ihåg så landade astronauterna på månen för första gången. 1969. Och då hade de med sig kameror från Göteborgska Hasselblad. Och med hjälp av dem så skapades en dokumentation som bestod av tusental fotografier. Och det här företagsarkivet, ett Hasselblads arkiv, har överlämnats till Riksarkivet, Landsarkivet i Göteborg. Och här finns bland annat då bilderna från Apollo-expeditionen 1969. Och I minglet före middagen ikväll så kommer ni att få chansen att uppleva en unik installation som heter Acid House Live Space Jam. Och det är ett samarbete mellan Landsarkivet och musikern och skivbolagsdirektören Jens Wickelgren. Han kommer att interagera med bilderna från månlandningen. Det får ni absolut inte missa, så kom i tid till detta. Vid sex tiden ungefär. Men nu återgår vi till programmet and I'm very happy to introduce to you David Spreckmeister who is a technology strategist and one of the founders of GRU. Uh, it's a creative digital agency in Amsterdam and he's going to talk about killing the monolith, modular tech for Stedelijk Museum. Floor is yours. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm uh, David. As you said, a technology strategist and one of the founders of GUR, creative digital agency in Amsterdam. And um, yeah, I've been to Sweden many times. This is my first time in Gothenburg. Um, it's lovely to be here. Great conference you have. And um, I'd like to tell you a bit more about GUR uh, to start off with. Like, maybe first the pronunciation, because people do ask me that. Like kind of depends on my mood. You know, sometimes you need to challenge the status quo and it's more like But uh, today is a lovely day, so let's do grr instead. Uh, we have 16 years of experience with online projects, and this is what we do. Um, design, technology, and strategy. So these could be websites, platforms, content strategy, branding, that kind of stuff. We think the best results come from when you treat these three pillars equally. So uh, that's why we have 25 designers, developers, and uh, in-house specialists to make that work. And this is why we do it. Um, we work for what we call meaningful matters. Um, for instance, culture like the Stedelijk Museum or Rijksmuseum, which are two of the most prominent um, museums in the Netherlands. Also the Royal Concert Hall, which is maybe a little bit comparable to, to this place, but then in Amsterdam. But also the Ocean Cleanup, which is a great initiative. They're trying to invent new ways to fish plastic out of the oceans. Uh, Doctors Without Borders, and a lot of education-related projects for the city of Amsterdam. And this is just a few. We also do a lot of other environmental, uh, governmental, humanitarian projects for clients. So my talk today is about the importance of being free from technological monoliths and how you can accomplish this as an organization or an institute. So to look at the definition of what a monolith is, it's broadly speaking a large, indivisible, 
and very powerful entity, but it's also often associated with uh, being slow or unwilling to change. Now, specifically, I'm talking about monolithic architecture in online projects. So this could be your website, uh, maybe a platform, web application, something like that. And this means instead of your application having a single purpose, it actually does a whole lot of jobs, much like a Swiss army knife. It can be practical, of course, but it's generally not the most ergonomic, you know? Imagine your server or your software being like this. Uh, a jack of all trades, as we say, is often the master of none. So instead of this single monolithic application that does everything, we much prefer independence modules. Small standalone applications, highly specialized in what they do. So they have a single purpose, and they communicate with each other through open standards. And that way you can pick the best tool for the job, the best language, I mean programming language in that sense, uh, and the best framework. So let's make this concrete. The example I'd like to give you is from Stadium Museum Amsterdam, for which we did the online identity and the website. A tiny bit about the Stedelijk Museum. It's an international museum dedicated to modern and contemporary art and design. And they really love innovation and experiments. So they were the first museum, for instance, with an audio tour. And in 1938, they painted all their walls white, um, what is still referred to as the white cube nowadays, which is still used in a lot of museums. So the briefing for their online presence was that it should be modern, it should be easy to use, it should be accessible, and with accessible I mean suited for, for instance, visually impaired people, uh, you know, contrast-wise, but also very suited for screen readers, which blind people use, and people with various levels of motor skills. But last, uh, last but not least, it should also be a bold statement, they said, in interactive design. Now, ease of use and bold statement uh, can sometimes be a challenging combination. So, we went through this very intensive and very interesting process together with them, and this is what we came up with in the end. So the bold statement in this um, appearance is what we like to call web brutalism. It has a strong focus on typography. Um, it has also natural language search, so basically search functionality focused on humans, you know, not so much thought from a machine perspective. And we use engagement triggers, like the little emoji hand, to lure people actually into using that search. So the result, we think, is quite intuitive of use. It's also designed with a statement, whether you like it or not, but it's a statement. Um, and it's also accessible and, in that sense, inclusive because we focus on accessibility standards. We didn't want to do any concessions for you know, performance or accessibility. And a little spoiler alert is that it ended well because we won uh, three European Design Awards for this project. Now, this is not just for visual design, it's for interactive design. So as the technology strategist, I'd like to show you how we made these three pillars work together to accomplish this. And the main key is to design for a modular architecture. So by separating functionality in into independent modules, 
you avoid having to make concessions. So a traditional monolithic architecture, schematically simplified a bit, uh, would look like this, like one framework, one programming language, and made by one vendor, you know, the company that you work with. So typical functionality that you find in a lot of projects, but that you also find in StateLook, is the static HTML, which is the public part of the website that actually makes the website look like it looks, that ends up in your browser. Uh, the renderer, which is dynamically generating this HTML, because you know the content changes, and then the HTML, in effect, changes. A CMS of sorts, because you want to insert and update your content, and a login components so that your users can authenticate and authorize. And the aforementioned search, you know, to search through the pages on your site or the collection. So what if we replace these components with separate modules adhering to open standards? To start off with the HTML renderer, we could replace it with a static site generator, which is a process that runs outside of the monolith, outside of that one framework. And it only needs to generate new HTML when the content changes. We could do the same thing with the CMS. We could replace it with a standalone, independent content as a service, as it's called. So this is a headless CMS which means that it has an API that machines from different processes can read and is decoupled from the site layout. So, you know, traditionally, the CMS is often coupled to the, what the site looks like. We could do the same thing with the login. We could replace it with a standalone OAuth service. And OAuth is an open standard for authorization and authentication. And the search, in this case, you know, for Stadelik, we replace it with Elasticsearch, which is a very modern open source product that allows like, rich search functionality, like faceted search and fuzzy search. You know. And now, in this setup, they no longer have to be on the same server in the same framework. The result is a very flexible and durable architecture with modules that communicate through open standards. And why do I keep hammering on that? Well, I think it's important because it starts out with a very common misconception. Like both inside and outside the world of technology, there is this notion concerning digital architecture that, you know, Let's design the thing first and then build it. So this kind of implies that you know up front what the end result is going to look like exactly. And then the project is finished and they lived happily ever after or something. Like I think a long, lot of you know that this in reality is not uh, really feasible. That's why you know a lot of project management techniques like Agile and Scrum appeared. Maybe you heard of that. So what I propose is to drop this construction metaphor for the development of digital projects. Instead, I think development is much more like gardening. So if you start out small and if you give it some room to grow, and if you also give it some love and attention after the first version has gone live, very important, then the results are going to be better. Because we can't really know up front what will happen, except that technology around us will change, and probably a lot of other factors as well. And that's why it's important to choose an architecture that allows you to change course 
and to innovate, of course, because otherwise we're going to get caught up with reality. So this is also a condition for flexible partnerships. And what do I mean with partnerships? It can be you know, in relation to your vendor or to your developers, and maybe even the choice for a certain tool or a service that's essential to your company or to your organization. So what if we don't do that? I'd like to show you some scenarios and you know, see if you recognize any of these, maybe. So a vendor might say, oh, your whole web platform is outdated. You know, we need to throw it out, we need to trash it, and then design and develop the whole thing anew. I'd say a flexible architecture could have prevented that, because you can replace parts instead. Or, you know, sometimes you like to renew some elements, but stuff is all tangled up. And you change a little bit here, and then the rest breaks down over there. It's mostly also a sign of not so flexible or modular architecture. Or maybe, you know, you found a new specialist, or a, a cool new tool, or this like innovative AI-driven service, or what have you but your existing vendor is a little too, too greedy. Maybe your business is more important to them than if they're the right solution for the job. Maybe your technology is getting old because of past choices or, or monopolies. And what about the ownership of code or data? Specific technical frameworks are tied to specific vendors. And often, proprietary technology is used instead of open standards and open source. And then, unfortunately, the monolith turns into a monopoly. Technology lock-in often leads to vendor lock-in. So instead, you know, I'd like to aim for voluntary, long-lasting partnerships instead of a form of Stockholm Syndrome. I know I'm in Gothenburg, but you know. So we need architecture with flexibility in mind to enable future-proof cooperation. And in the long run, I think that flexible partnerships are better for all parties involved. So another modular architecture example from Stalik is about the art collection. This is a proprietary commercial art collection service they had running, they have running. It's like a commercial product. It's uh, 120,000 artworks kept up to date and is running on a machine uh, in the museum. Now this product, I'm not gonna name any names, but it's uh, quite a famous product to you know, manage art collections. This also allows you to create a site or have your visitors search the database or you know, display artworks online. And you might say, well, that's nice. We already have it running. We, we're paying for it. So let's just build the site with it. Sounds easy. But maybe, you know, I'd like you to ask yourself, um, could this single system by a single vendor, wasn't me, uh, serve the site fast enough, you know, Remember, it's running on-premise in the museum on a machine that I never saw, but it's not in a data center. Could it deliver a bold design statement you know, that they were asking for? Because we need really highly specialized templating systems to realize that kind of stuff. Could it be user-friendly? I'm not so sure that you know the people, the company behind a system that's maintaining art collections is also very user-friendly when it comes to a website? And could it deliver the best accessibility standards? It's doubtful, I think. It's more likely, maybe, that you might end up like this. With you know, a monolithic system, no open standards, left to the vendor's agenda, and phew, there goes your autonomy. 
So remember this traditional monolith with the components that we discussed earlier. Here is their existing collection service, you know, the product that, that I was just talking about. Now, we could have built this embedded collection functionality inside the, a traditional monolith. But instead, we built a, developed a standalone microservice to synchronize the collection between the collection database system and the site. And you know, next to synchronizing, it also cleaned up some data and stuff like that. Um, it runs a different language than other modules in the system. It runs Node.js, which is really fast at doing certain things, like synchronizing a large database. But maybe it's not the best fit for other tasks in the system. And if you would want to switch collection service, you know, maybe the company that delivers the database, you know, they, they finish their business or whatever, then you have to adapt the microservice, but you don't have to touch the other parts in the system. Another benefit is that it runs on demand, which means that it only uses resources when it's actually synchronizing new changes you know, to the art collection. And if you use a wrapper like OpenFast, which is um, it's kind of like a contract for you know, this module's behavior, it's open source, it's an open standard, then you can actually host it with any cloud provider you want. So like Amazon or Google, Microsoft, or for instance, Kubernetes, which allows you to run it everywhere, like in, even on tiny computers or whatever. And then you can switch, and you have you know, less of a monopoly going on. So the benefits are that modules are easier to replace or to upgrade, because they work independently. You can use the same functionality as well in other contexts. And that's really cool, because you can sort of use them like Lego blocks. You know? We did the same thing with existing components for the city of Amsterdam. Uh, we made a, an open data API for the public school data. It's also more secure, because you don't need to expose certain vulnerable or sensitive parts. You only need to expose what you're actually exposing, instead of the whole monolith. And it performs better, because you can pick the best tool for the job, so the best fitting language, specialized hosting, and you only have to scale up the modules that need scaling up. So by that I mean like if the site is getting super busy because you have a, an exposition that's really popular or something like that, you don't have to scale up the whole monolith, but you only need to scale up the public site parts, as it were. So some practical takeaways, three practical takeaways from Static Museum project that you might be able to use for yourself. Design modular. So design self-contained systems and choose specialized vendors and tools. Start simple. So give it room to grow and start as small. And stay flexible in that way. Don't get caught up by past choices or monopolies. And you know, I'm talking about this, my you know, our own project, but to not just display our own product as a best example, Netflix is also one of the first recent um, advocates of this strategy. They're highly commercial and successful, not so much open or idealistic, of course but they still run around 700 microservices nowadays. And I think there's an even better example, which is Linux. It's an incredibly successful operating system uh, conceived in 1991, you know, made by a Finnish guy, Linus Torvalds. And most websites in the world run on it. Um, it's also used as a component, component or a foundation in a lot of other projects, like also commercial products. 87% of smartphones run on it because it's the foundation of Android. And that's possible because of the 
philosophy of Linux, which is everything is open source, so everyone can adjust it and work together to improve it. But also, it contains small, single-purpose pur modules working together like Lego blocks. And after decades, a lot of these modules still are working great, which is quite incredible because they're older than when the net was still looking like this. <laughs> yep. This modular approach enables us to accomplish some higher human values that I'd like to close off with. To make it last, to develop durable technology. And I think that especially when working with public funds, we kind of have an obligation to do that. To work together using open standards, open source, you know, wherever possible, we always make things open source. And to share our knowledge, because the net is actually a leap in human evolution. So let's not keep information to ourselves if it's not necessary. Give your audience access to data. They might come up with some very interesting uses that you haven't thought of yourself. So I'll be around for the coffee and the fika, of course. I wouldn't want to miss that. Um, and you can reach me here for further questions. And uh, if there are any technology geeks, do check out our open source on GitHub, open source projects. And I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, David. Do we have any questions, David? Thank you. Um, very interesting uh, um, presentation. Uh, I think a lot of uh, companies, as you say, and but also some museums are starting to work in this way now. Uh, I was particularly curious about uh, the login service, uh, which you use a separate service. Uh, firstly, what what different um, services do you um, the public do you use the login service for? And do you host your own authentication server, or is it a software as a service? Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, it kind of depends on the project. So uh, for instance, there are some really great open source products, like Hydra is one um, written in Go. Um, you can host it yourself, but it's also hosted. And there are some commercial products as well, uh, like Auth0, that have a free tier, actually. So I think it's up to uh, 2,000 or 5,000 logins per period. You can actually use it for free. So only the really big um, you know, consumers uh, are paying for it. And there are quite a lot of vendors that um, deploy their own technology like that. So you can, you can do both. Uh, in this case, uh, we did it ourselves with a um, with the open source system. Yeah. And yeah, and we use it. Yeah, sorry. The other part of your question, uh, like uh, the, it, it can be used for your end users, so your visitors, but also if you're using a. Uh, a CMS or like the content as a service, you also need your administrators to log in. So that's also, we also see that as kind of an end user of another level. Right. I, I know the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, they have this uh, login service for the collection online yeah. at the Rijksstudio. But that would be, that's hundreds of thousands of uses uh, eventually, not necessarily active uses, but. <laughs> So um, with with a um, hosted well software as a service that will be impossible with um, the kind of uh, pricing that you have with Auth0, for instance. So we need something something different. Yeah, there's like at a certain point there's a tipping point. You know, if you're if it's used a lot, then it really pays off to to host it yourself, mm. to deploy it yourself. Thank you. Thanks. Do you have time for another question? <clears throat> Thank you.
perhaps more of a comment. I really liked your, your metaphor of thinking of technology as organic, <laughs> in a way, and responsive to its environment. And also looking at the aesthetics of uh, the uh, interface for the museum. Uh, and it, to me, it's very avant-garde. And right. in a way also, I'm thinking about the, the reaction to the high modernist literature and art in the early 1900s and how the avant-garde wanted to break up the monolithic <laughs> Right, canon. right. So in That's a way, I can see an analogue between your company and uh, the way that you think about new kinds of digital solutions. That's a very interesting comparison, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, because I was thinking then, because it's very apt working with that particular museum of modern art, but that's something that you also take into account. What kind of museum is it, the aims of the museums and so on? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, they were, you know, they, they are very adventurous in that sense. So if, if you know uh, to convince them, they're very much open to new uh, stuff, basically, new adventures, uh, not just visually, but also in the way things work. And they're, uh, they're, yeah, they're a very nice uh, client to work with in that sense. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Yeah, good. Okay, thank you so much, David. Thanks. 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 Thanks.